Everybody, welcome to Digital Asset News, or Dan for short. Uh, today is Friday. You know what that means. It means DCA Live. So as always, my faithful compatriots, uh, Ben from Into the Cryptoverse and James from Invest Answers, joining me to answer some of, the, some of the tough questions, the tougher questions that we potentially have. And also, before we get into it, of course, if you haven't uh, subscribed to Ben or James' channel, uh, you can find their, uh, there's a link in the description for both of them. Also, check out uh, James's Patreon group, and Ben's got a banger of a website, intothecryptoverse.com, where I steal as much information as I possibly can and go from there. So, gentlemen, thanks for coming by. Happy Friday. <laughs> that was that was the worst happy friday i've ever heard yeah, exactly. happy friday get off my lawn kids all right so so here so here's the question <clears throat> the markets and projects projects continue to fall we see it going uh, it's just just happens and here we are so what errors did you make along the way and what did it teach you i think it's good for a retrospective especially since I think a lot of people miss the FTX thing. What could we have done differently? You know, how, how can we move forward? And of course, from the lessons learned, uh, has this changed the directory of your investing, how you do things, how you do research, and also for, you know, your specific channel in general. And then this is the one we're going to probably spend a lot of time on, which is knowing what we know now. What's the path forward for our crypto market? And that and we're going to go over a, a litany of, of different topics. Regulation, consolidation, meaning the projects that are actually here are going to collapse or eventually collapse. And actually, as they get absorbed into, whole, unfortunately, the Binance ecosystem, uh, retail versus institutional investors, and then, of course, public perception. That's a very loaded question, and we'll take that bit by bit. Lastly, where's SBF in one year's time? Quick question. And uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But then the last one I want to spend a lot more time on, which is the q and I pulled a lot of people's uh, questions from uh, Twitter. But, of course, we'll take them uh, as they come in live. So, gentlemen, gentlemen, let's start with the first one. Make this, make this simple. The markets, they suck. They collapsed on us really because of uh, a couple of swan events, right? So what errors you make along the way and what it teach you? Ben, you're just to my right, so I'm going to start with you, my man. Well, I mean, and by the way, excuse my voice. I do have a cold. Uh, it's a side effect of having three young kids. <laughs> yeah, you got to, oh yeah, yeah. The Petri dish that is the kids. Gotcha. Yeah, so I'll do my best to, to talk through this. But um, look, I, I, I first of all, I will say as an investor, you're not going to get everything right. And you know, I had a, I had a guest on my channel the other day, Mark Yusko, and one of the things he said was, if you yeah. if you're in the business of getting everything right, you know, investing is not the right business for you, uh, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. So I think in general, the expectation is that we will get things wrong. Um, you know, I, I've over the years, I've, I've certainly got a number of things wrong. Uh, most recently, I, I would suppose that some of the things that have not really gone the way that I thought are things like I, you know, I'm surprised that certain altcoins are holding up as well as they are. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Ethereum Bitcoin valuation remains a lot higher than I thought it would be at this point. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I, I think we have good years and we have bad years. And, and for the most part, I would say 2022, I've, I feel like I've done a better job this year than, than maybe other years. Um, but it took me so, so like if we were to just sort of go through the cycle, right. And, and, and for me to walk through kind of where I went astray. So back in 2019 and, and 2020, I was quite, I was quite bullish on, on the crypto market actually. Sure. And yeah. And I mean, in hindsight, that was the, 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 I think that was the, the way to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the first mistakes I made, <laughs> One of the first mistakes I made uh, back when the bull market started was I, I bought XRP the day before the SEC announced the, the son lawsuit. of a gun. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. like, well, maybe it was like the week before. I don't remember. Um, man, I, that got me yeah. wrecked. And, and I mean, that got me wrecked right off the bat, right? Um, <laughs> in in 2021, you know, I, I I felt like I had a pretty good handle on things back in like the March and April time frame. I, I thought we would go down in the summer. And then I thought we would go back up after, you know, we had a brief bear market and we did, but mm -hmm. I assumed that it would, it would, we would, we would have a few more months, right? I thought the bull market would last a little bit longer past right. November. 
And so I, I basically yeah. missed the November peak, um, which I think a lot of people did. And I mean, even the bears, even the bears missed it because I think a lot of the bears were not calling for, for all time highs regardless. Right. I mean, after the first peak, a lot of people were pretty bearish and, and saying, you know, it was, it was over. Um, and we did go yeah. put in a new all time high. Uh, yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it, it only was a, a marginally higher price than what we had previously seen. And so, I mean, essentially for, for 2021, like all of the profits that I took for the most part were in, in like March and April. Right. Um, I, I didn't really hit the second peak at all. And I finally cut my, I finally cut my positions down considerably in, in January and February because it, it took me that long, you know, to, yeah. to, to accept, right. That it was over. Right. Like it took me until, you know, January, February to be like, you know what? Like it's over, right? The, the bull market's over. We're going yeah. into a bear market. 2022 is going to suck. Cash is king. You know, if you want to buy altcoins, you shouldn't. You should go take a cold shower and reconsider. Um, so, I mean, like once, you know, once I, I was able to come to terms with that, that that was where we were headed, I felt like I was able to, to sort of adapt my strategy. And, you know, I, I cut out a lot of altcoins back in, you know, January, February, and March, we had that, you know, that, that first bear market rally up to 48K yeah. Bitcoin and, you know, some of the altcoins went with it. Um, I was able to, I was able to offload, you know, most, uh, most of the altcoins that I had that, that I hadn't already sold in, you know, in March and April of, of the previous year. So, I mean, you know, looking mm -hmm. back, um, I, I think one thing that, you know, will, has sort of how it, how it's, how it stood with me is that, you know, it's always hard to predict exactly when something is going to occur. Uh -huh. You might you might have a good expectation on it occurring at some point, right? Like we might say, well, um, you know, I, I think this is going to happen or I think we're going to go to the high risk bands and all that stuff. But it's right. always hard to know exactly when it's going to happen, right? Um, so I, I would say, this is, I mean, those are, the, those are probably the biggest things, like the biggest takeaways. And then you know, I also in in mid twenty twenty two, I was trying to get cute and and and, <laughs> and and time one of these bear market rallies, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I put out a video in June, being like, "All right, I think we're gonna have a, I think we're gonna have oh, a bear market I'm... rally soon." And it, and it took another month, right? It took another month to see that. So, I mean, I, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, you know, I just recognize I'm not going to get everything right, um, but I, for the most part, I mean, I think. You know, cash has remained king this year, um, and and hopefully, I mean, hopefully, twenty twenty three will be a better year than twenty twenty two. Yeah, in terms of in terms of the in terms of the market, you know. I yeah, I I totally I totally agree, and I, I'm with you on this one. It's just the reason why I wanted to talk about about our errors is because I get a lot of people who are in in the chat or in Twitter, and they're like, "Man, I really screwed up. I didn't I didn't take any profits." or I put too much on this exchange, or I did this, and I'm so stupid, I can't believe it. I should have done more of my research, I should have really you know, done been, been better, and I'm like, you know, you, you understand that no one's perfect, right? And that even, you know, we make mistakes, and people above us make mistakes, and even Mr. Wonderful, and, and, uh, and the Mooch Scaramucci, and people, and higher up, they make mistakes left and right, because just like Ben talked about, if, uh, like, like what Mark Yusko said, if you want to be perfect, uh, investing is not the category for you because you are not going to get it perfect and the best that you can hope for is that you're right more than 50 percent of the time i, I there's a, a, a stat which talks about different traders and, and options and all that the people that, that do well are the ones that uh, get it right around 58 percent as opposed to less than 50. so it's one of those things like if you feel bad about the things that, or the, the choices that you made it's not the end of the world you just got to learn from it you pick yourself up and you keep going forward just like the military you show up with the right uniform you raise your hand and go okay i'm here to i'm here to do my job and then just keep going forward that's the big thing so i'll step off my stoke box now and then uh james uh what do you got my man yeah that was a great one from mark yusko and uh it's hard and nobody has a crystal ball but I think first yeah. is, you know, we, we, we always spoke about self-custody and I've got, I don't know, 10 or 15 videos on wallets and stuff like that and the importance of those and having a good wallet. But I always felt it was okay to leave 10 to 20% on an exchange for trading purposes because that's kind of, you know, how you play. Now, that's that's been shattered. Like now mm -hmm. I am absolutely terrified of 
leave me anything on any of these places. Uh, so the big lessons, I think, what we've learned in 2022 is nothing is too big to fail. Uh, don't trust governments to protect you. I mean, the calamity of FTX, FTX US, SEC, private meetings between SBF and Gary Gensler is just sickening. And I don't know why people aren't more upset about that. Um, the other big learning is I think everything is completely related, interconnected. Everything's a house of cards, ripple effect, contagion. We've been hit with two black swans. Yeah. But technically, they're all a function of the same thing. You know, one big liquidation event, cascading mm -hmm. leverage, wiping everything out. It's just that's that's the big thing. So uh, that leads me to the next point, I think, for us all to know is transparency is key. Mm -hmm. Only trust things that are highly transparent, whether they be tokens or protocols or exchanges or you know proof of reserves whatever that's sure. going to be absolutely critical as we go forward uh, the other one that was kind of stunning and uh, i did not take you know uh, twitter seriously um mm -hmm. or you know early 2022 that was a mistake twitter has emerged i think as the strongest source of truth this season um, I'd like to hear your guys' feedback on that, but it's it, all the truth, all the you know exposure is coming through Twitter. Uh, people like Dylan LeClaire are exposing stuff, sure. uh, so some yeah, of yeah. the mags as well, uh, some of the insiders, some of the people looking at on-chain transactions. That is something very, very powerful, and people should take Twitter very seriously. Um, next, I think it's you know. DeFi all the way, although it's still in its infancy, it is not mature, it's not liquid enough, but DeFi over CeFi, I think if anything we've learned in summary is kind of self-custody and decentralization. That's what's required for self-sovereignty. Do not trust anybody anywhere. The other things like when there's smoke, there's fire. I've always said that for years and years, but mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the type of Forest fires that are behind some of this smoke are just unbelievable. Again, going back to the first point, again, nothing's too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And um, I think final note, 2023 will be better despite the recession because it cannot be worse, uh, in my opinion. So yeah. that's kind of my quick and dirty summary. Um, gotcha. So, I mean, that was great. I mean, we, we, I, I think on that one, you talked about, you know, what it, what it taught you and I think uh, the market in general. But stepping back to the question, like any, anything that you, you think to yourself, like, man, I kind of messed that up. I wish I wouldn't have done it that thing or that, that trade or, 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 or that uh, philosophy or, or, or the way it is. I mean, is there anything that, that's happened like in the last know, six months or so where you kind of think to yourself, man, I wish I could have, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> well, <laughs> It's 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 kind of funny because I reflect on this a lot, and mm -hmm. you know I never touched crypto till 2017. I dabbled with a little bit of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Timing was not perfect, and then slowly accumulated because I was always obsessed with the hardness. And then I became a DGen in March 2020 <laughs> and bought some Ethereum for the yeah. first time ever. I was like a Bitcoin maxi until 2020. I did. I thought everything else was kind of weird, and and then I then I got the bug, and then I did a lot of fundamental analysis mm -hmm. uh, to try identify any threat to Twitter and I came up with the solution and of course here we are so it, yeah. it shows you when when I saw Shiba Inu having a higher market cap than Solana it's like okay fundamental analysis doesn't work in crypto mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work at all so I don't know and, and then again it goes back to the first point I mentioned before is how the ripple effect of everything being interrelated right. is a problem and you know, how, not having that transparency of, you know, how dirty people are behind the scenes and the games they're playing oh, yeah. is kind of uh, terrifying. So that is is kind of a big part. But you manage risk by having proper allocations and never having, you know, I always talk about the risk curve. The further you go out the risk curve, the smaller your position. And yeah. uh, that's where I am. So, you know. Gotcha. I don't know. It, it's weird. It's been it's been fun. I still really do believe in crypto, and I believe layer ones will be a thing, and I believe people need hard money like Bitcoin. So I'm not I'm shaken, not stirred. I don't know if that's even an expression, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I still remain very bullish. And I know this stuff can move fast. We are in you know we thought June sixteenth was the dark of the darkness, right? 
and uh, it's just darker yet again. And people are definitely shaking right now. I see a lot of people leaving the space. A lot of people, you know, they're moving back to gold. They're thinking about bonds. Um, they're just mm. burnt, really badly burnt. And uh, that's that's kind of sad, the damage that a few bad people have done, which is yeah. sad to me. Yeah, it is what it is. You know, so, all right, makes sense forever there. And then we'll get to the next one. I'll just talk about... Uh, I'll talk about my errors. So I hope everybody's got uh, a little bit of time uh, as we as we go with this this uh, massive list of my screw ups. But uh, I will say this: I will start with, uh, with with June. You know, people. You know, June say, "Ah, it's the bottom. It's the bottom. That's the bottom. That's it. That's it. That's it." And I was like, "It's not the bottom." But I thought it was going to be because of macro events, because of the Fed, because of war, because of uh, the supply chain issues and everything else. I didn't expect FTX to blow up. So even though I, you know, I got one part of that right, it wasn't the reason for it, you know, for, for what happened. And that's just that part. Going back uh, b- before that, do you know, of course, uh, gentlemen, we have, uh, you can't really see. Oh, you can see right here. Okay. So I have these rules. You know why I have these rules here? I have these rules because I screwed up before. And, when I, and, and I made these rules because of when I was talking about Celsius, because I thought it was awesome, but it wasn't awesome. And they were doing, it was, it was great until it wasn't. And then once I figured it out on that day, I put out a video. Nine hours later, they shut down withdrawals. Next day after that, I made these rules. It's all gone. That which means you cannot invest more than you can afford to lose. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. That's the second one. 100 percent scams. And there's no exchanges. Don't leave anything on exchanges. And I messed that up too because when I used to talk about it, I used to think them to myself like, okay, these Bitcoin maxes and things they talk about, they don't know. Because we can just put this into these exchanges because guess what? They are in the United States. They're somewhat regulated. They're a little bit more safer. And guess what? They weren't. So they were right. And of course, now I think to myself, everybody should be learning self-custody. So I say no exchanges. And this was back in, this was back in June. And of course, don't take leverage. 50, 100x is craziness and take profits along the way. And that's one of the things that uh, I try to try to do myself, but I still fail on that one. And that was Celsius. And of course, with the Voyager, I talked about that. Thankfully, I figured it out a little bit earlier when I figured out that, hey, they loaned three, three, uh, three arrows capital, $640 million, and it was uncollateralized. Are you kidding me? So, of course, I said, stop, take all your, your crypto off of there. Two weeks later, it was shut down. Thankfully, along the way, here we are. And then I think the biggest, the biggest thing, though, that, I, that has been taught to me recently is because of all these, these mess ups that I've done, that I think to myself, you know what? The, the principles of decentralization must live and we must use them. And there's a reason why we have these self-custody. There's a reason why we try to get rid of the middleman. With the reason why we do these things. Because uh, crypto is the future and not a, a slimy, centralized uh, Wall Street type of thing that's been going on in the background, but true decentralization. So moving forward, and we'll get to this later, uh, I'll try to get into more of those products that are truly decentralized and go from there. All right. I'll get out my soapbox yet again. Second one. And James, since we, we just started with you from the lessons learned, has this changed the, the directory of your investing or the directory, the direction, I should say, because I know you're more of a trader uh, than me or Ben, and you've got uh, a heavy experience in these areas. So has this changed anything for you as far as like how you invest and potentially your channel itself? Yeah, well, I've been doing kind of the same thing for 30 years, kind of like do a lot of research, get in early, get in hard, Mm -hmm. have a few positions, high conviction, option trade, hedge, take profits by selling kind of out of the money calls. And then with those profits, buy real estate. That's been my playbook for 30 years. And um, it's worked. But since, again, since 2017 in crypto, it's it's been a, a roller coaster. Um, you know, from, from a perspective, going back to some of my rules, kind of get in early, get in as hard as you can, like yeah. 94% of my crypto is still in the green. Like if you look at my positions and they're like, right now I only hold three things, Bitcoin and Ethereum are still positive. Solana is mm-hmm. 50% underwater. Um, but it's still, I still very much believe in the space. I believe in sure. where this is going. I believe the world needs that hard asset. Uh, in terms of my, would I change what I do? No. Like, for example, um, I'm always trying to find ways to trade back. And, you know, uh, I wasn't able to recoup 
my being 50% underwater on Solana right now. And I was yep. layering in during the dip. Um, <laughs> it's very weird because I think it was nearly two weeks ago. No, it's 13 days ago. Exactly. I made it back into the black on Solana for the first time. And then the next day, everything went to crap. But <laughs> just before that, about 15 days ago, I got into a position on Meta, which recouped half of my losses uh, mm-hmm. in very short order. Again, using dangerous options position, but I was kind of pissed off. So I think I'm going to spend more time, kind of like I b- bought as much crypto as I kind of wanted and focused on accumulating kind of solid equities after yeah. the summer and and that's kind of what i'll do is just focus much harder on moving around to where the action is at so crypto is out of favor right now equities are beaten down everything is kind of beaten down but there are things that are hitting rock bottom and bouncing off of that and we saw that early in the summer with well, middle of the summer with netflix yeah. we saw that recently with meta so there's still options to be had but what i can stress for people is you know, don't have all your eggs in the crypto basket and move to things right, you know, when they start to attract money because the money rotates around. Um, I did a video yesterday and looked at the kind of the nifty 50 versus the bottom 450, the S&P 500. Yeah. And again, there's even a rotation between those groups. But the majority of money actually goes to the black holes, the top 10 of the top 50 in the S&P 500. And that'll happen again. It's just right now, it's a bit of a risk off, but that risk on is coming back soon, I believe. So uh, the lesson I think is um, don't have don't have everything in yeah. Bitcoin. I remember a quote, actually, you mentioned a guy called Kevin O'Leary before, but I remember he said, yeah. I believe in crypto. It's, it's going to be the 12th or 11th segment of the S&P 500. So yeah, I yeah. bought the top 50. It's like <laughs> well, it's every rule of investing. When I heard that, you know, a year ago, I was like, face palm. No, <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, so again, in answer to your question, short answer is no, it's just been a brutal year. We mentioned the first, first, worst first half of the stock market in 50 True. years. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you just take it as we've been hit with too many black swans and storms and war and macro and fed. Yeah. And uh, next year should be better. Next year, hopefully, should be better, which would lead me to Ben. Same thing here. All the lessons learned. How has it changed the the investing? Or or what have you learned, I, I guess, from it? And has it changed your channel? You know, I think the the hardest parts are are in a bull market. It's easy to to get on the altcoin bandwagon, you know, and I I, I spoke a lot about altcoins. Um, mainly, I, I spoke about Chainlink and, and Cardano right. and, and Ethereum, et cetera, right? But I only had a few that I, I, I spoke about. Um, I think the hardest part is when you, when you shift to being bearish, like the, the community that you might have built up around you because they identify as being like a promoter of that project, yeah. they can feel somewhat betrayed. Um, <laughs> and I, I've experienced this myself in 2022 because you know i i was bullish on on the ethereum bitcoin valuation up until about halfway through this year and yeah. and when you when you switch to being bearish on something um you know a lot of the people that were your friends beforehand they're no longer your friends and and you know they 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 chastise you in in forums and in you know in telegram groups and in discords because you're no longer you know you're no longer bullish on on the project that sort of brought you all together in the first place. Uh, so I, I think it's hard for for a lot of people to understand that you know fundamentally I can be long term bullish, but I you know I reserve the right to be bearish for 12 months on a project if I think we're in a bear market. And so I would say that the, the most likely effect it, it'll probably have on my channel is honestly, at least on the public fa- facing side, is I'll probably talk less about altcoins uh, mm. in the next bull market. I, I'm not saying I won't talk about them at all, but it'll probably mostly be discussions around Bitcoin and Ethereum with occasional occasional videos on, on some, some, some altcoins. But for the most part, it, it's just a dangerous game to play because a lot of people get married to these altcoins. And, mm. and as someone, you know, if you have a lot of influence in the space, you know, you have to have the courage at some point to say, no, this altcoin is going to drop 95% or 98%. Like it's just, it's going to happen. 
even if you were bullish on it. You know, I mean, I was bullish on Cardano when it was two cents. And mm -hmm. and, you know, back in 2019, my my price prediction on it was somewhere between four to eight dollars and it made it to three dollars. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it went up one hundred and fifty X, but because it didn't go up that last, you know, that last little bit. It can leave some people upset, you know, um, sure, because the majority of the people that, that are going to stick around, at least when it first starts to go down, are the people that got in late, the people that got in early, they're happy. But the people that got in early represent such a small amount of the people that view you in a bull market. So that is something that, you know, maybe or maybe what, you know, maybe I'll talk more about the altcoin market in, you know, in what I would consider to be an accumulation year. And I've said all year, I've said all year that 2022 is not the time to buy altcoins, right? Um, and and so, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll continue with that sort of mentality of like, you know, maybe I'll talk about them some. But as we get further into whatever the next bull market is, like I'm probably just going to stop talking about them until until we get into the next after the next bear market, because they're so dangerous, right? Like they're so dangerous for people because a lot of people just come in really late. They buy up all these altcoins and then they ride them down 98 percent because they buy every single dip along the way. But in reality, a lot of these altcoins are pure scams. Um, I mean, that's the truth. A lot of them are 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 going to zero. And the ones that are not going to zero can still correct 95 to 98 percent. And we've seen this happen literally every single bear market, you know. And I, I mean, I thought that I thought that by switching my tune in Q1, you know, it would help. It would help minimize, you know, how, how difficult it would be for people. But even though I've I've you know been adamant about not buying altcoins in 2022, there still are a lot of people that experience is the only teacher that they're going to have. Like, it, it doesn't matter what I say. Um, they're just going to have to live through it. And until they live through it, they're not going to learn their lesson. And once they live through it for a cycle, uh, then they'll then they'll learn their lesson for the next cycle. So probably uh, I just I will talk less about altcoins. I'm not saying I won't talk about them at all, but I'll, I'll talk more about, um, you know, some other things like the macroeconomic stuff, um, probably more about the stock market. Uh, just some other things, because I think it's good for people to have like a, a diversified, a diversified portfolio and and not to just be throwing all their money at these at these altcoins, which, which frankly, most people have no clue what they even do. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah. That is the truth. That That is it. So excellent points, both of you. So I will just say uh, for this one, from as far as the lessons learned, I wish I would have listened to uh, to Ben a little bit more on the uh, take a cold shower. Because as you know, I've still been doing what's called micro DCAing uh, for alts. And I buy, but the majority is the Bitcoin, Ethereum type of thing. And and I go on, I'm trying to take more profits along the way. Because I know at some point in the bull, when the bear bull market returns, that's the point when you're actually going to say, I need to start taking more profits. And, then, and it goes from there. So I will say that that is just, just one part. The second part for me as far as like how it's going to change my channel the things that have been going on i'll be harping more on the rules that i have down there and the and the next big thing is self-custody i think if we want to move ourselves into the next era of crypto we can't be banks 2.0 which is essentially what, what exchanges are we want to get away from them and actually give what it was supposed to be meant for which is a little bit of power more towards the people now Ben, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to still talk about altcoins because, unfortunately, people are still going to buy them. But I'd like to get more and talk more about the, the products that I really, not about the money side, but I think that I actually do quite well moving forward. Because let's be honest, 99% of those, of those cryptos, they're going to, they're, they don't do anything. But they are great when you buy them. And then, of course, you sell them. But unfortunately, when you buy something and you ride it all the way up and you sell it, who are you selling it to? You dump it on somebody. And that's really what it comes down to. So these are the things that I think about. And moving forward, I'm going to be a little more um, stringent on the things that I talk about. All right. So moving past that, as we've all cleansed ourselves now, let's talk about what we know now and all the things that you know we've, we've experienced. What's the path forward for a crypto market? And there's a lot of things. Regulation, consolidation, retail, institutional investors, and public perception. It's a lot of things to, to, to talk about. Ben, I'm going to start with you. And you can take any of these parts. You can take 
the regulation, public perception, or just one part, however you want to do it. But we can bounce back and forth. This is a very loaded question to see where we go. How do we, how do we move into a next to get away from where we are now to a better place in the crypto market? Well, I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, we still run the risk of not learning our lessons and, and repeating the same mistakes as last cycle. Because I, I, I remember in 2018 thinking, surely people aren't going to fall for the same scams again. And they did. So, <laughs> it's um, true. I mean, and, and, and for the people that think this whole thing with FTX is, is somewhat new. No, it's not. I mean, we've had this stuff happen before. This is not the first exchange to go down and it probably won't be the last. I think that where it differs is just the scale of it. Yeah. Uh, but th these things plague every bear market, every bear market, the exchanges go down because people make dumb choices. Uh, they're humans, right? They're greedy. They want to make money. So they take, you know, they, they do bad things with other people's money. It happens every market cycle. Uh, you know, so the idea that all of these are, are, are black swans is just not true, right? Like it's just a bear market and, and these things happen in bear markets. Um, and you just have to, you have to learn your lesson and, and say, you know what, how do we make it better for next time? Well, probably we're going to have to have a significant amount of regulation before I think it makes any sense for anyone to promote any centralized platform again. Um, mm. And, you know, I don't promote this stuff, but I also I'm not going to sit here and say that none of it should never be promoted. I, I do understand that there's like a, a reason that mm. some platforms, you know, deserve, you know, promotions and stuff. But the main the main thing that keeps me from doing it is because like I, I, I just feel like there's not sufficient regulation and there's just no transparency. Like you don't know what these exchanges are doing with your money. Um, and so I think, you know, I think before before people can really realistically promote any of that stuff. You need more. You need a lot more regulation, and you need a lot more transparency with what's actually going on. And I will say, you know, the the, the exchanges that survive this bear market will probably, you know, move up a level in my eyes, um, right. because it's a pretty brutal bear market to live through. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to promote them or anything, but you know, if you if you're just trying to figure out what exchange to use, is it is it better to use an exchange that pops up in 2025 to take advantage of that bull market? Or is it better to use an exchange that has weathered multiple bear markets? And you probably want to go with one that has, has stood the test of time. Um, True. I, I, I am a little bit, you know, I mean, with, with the split Congress now, I don't even know how much regulation they're going to even get through now. Uh, so we, we could really run the risk of, um, of not seeing a ton of new stuff happen between now and, and I mean, I, I think some stuff will come out, but I mean, this stuff takes forever. You know, I mean, this stuff takes forever. We could, we could still be sitting here and, in the 20 in 2026 still wondering when regulation is going to occur um in, in any meaningful way but i i will say that um you know i i think that a lot of the altcoin market is likely going to be declared securities is is my guess um i don't know i, I don't know where the line will be drawn i mean i i don't think bitcoin is security and I think there's there, there's a case to be made for Ethereum, but even that, I don't I don't think there's any clear guidance that that won't say they won't also declare that as security as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I you know I I think that we we desperately need clarification because look all the big money like they're not coming back until there's more clarity in my opinion right I mean mm -hmm. if if you have FTX as right. your as custodian of your crypto. And you were an institution or, you're, you know, you were someone with a lot of money or, or say like, you know, you had institutional custody of, of um, over on FTX and you lost your money. You're not coming back. Right. Not until there's more clarity. Um, so we need we need this regulation, uh, whether we like it or not, because it, until we get it, it's not going to really lead to to um, overall adoption. Now, I do think Bitcoin can survive regardless i mean i don't think bitcoin is security i mean it's uh, i think it's fairly obvious that it's, True. it's it's not so i mean i i also think that without without regulation you know you you run the risk of of the scams repeating themselves again yeah. and you also without regulation you also let me say this one of the good things about regulation is that it will instantly get rid of of a lot of the people that can't afford to file for it, right? Like, so all the all the BS projects that have no business doing anything, um, it'll it, it should get rid of those fairly quickly. But 
I think, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think that it, it's probably going to take a lot longer than we want, and it's going to drag out for years. Even the stuff with the SEC and, and XRP has dragged out for, what, two years now? It's been some um, time. Yeah, so I think regulation is coming. I think it's going to be relatively slow. And, I mean, once we get through this phase, I think the crypto market will probably be better off for it. Uh, but that's just the truth. I mean, you know, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to sit by and, and just let people create cryptocurrencies and altcoins forever without having any 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 type of regulation to protect customers and listen in a bull market everyone likes to make fun of of them for protecting customers but in a bear market everyone wants them to get you know protect them and get them their money back exactly uh, and they lose it on these platforms so um yeah something to think about yeah something to think about and and james before i before i get 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 back to you i uh i watched uh jesse powell former uh, CEO Kraken. of Kraken, and uh, he was on Bankless, and he talked about how the FTX uh, kind of blindsided a lot of people. And he talked about, and Jesse Powell has, has been around in uh, uh, for forever in the crypto space. He even talked about going over to Mount Gox and helping them with their first hack. He goes, remember there was two hacks, and uh, he said that for the FTX fraud that that came about, he said a lot of people that he knew personally that have been in crypto for a numerous amount of years who were considered the crypto OGs, they lost a hellacious amount of money. Because why? Because they didn't remember the lessons learned, which is self-custody. So like, I, I know, Ben, you said that institutions aren't going to come back and assume before regulation. I think that's true. Unfortunately, there's one part of it, and it's this, this aspect of greed where they put blinders on and they kind of just, just rush in. Not that they're all going to come in. That'd, that'd be ridiculous. That'd be silly. But I, I, I do think like, I like, I'm sure the Mount Cox people are like, well, who would ever, you know, leave their, their crypto or the Bitcoin exchange. That's, that sounds ridiculous after the, after the big hack. Now here we are going again and again and again, and things just repeat themselves, which is why I put the rules up and talk a lot about them. Hopefully I can remember to do these things moving forward. So, James, the next loaded, the loaded question, again, would go to you. Uh, the same thing that uh, Ben talked about. What do you got? Yeah, well, regulation is needed for money to come in, but you did mention something important, that is greed. So yes. I think a lot of the problem is, you know, like just talk about pension funds for an example. Right. Like pension funds have been hit twice, uh, summer, uh, and both out of Canada, believe it or not, and then with FTX, because... The pension funds are trying to make alpha. They manage huge amounts of money and they feel they need exposure to something to kickstart their portfolios because the rest of the stuff is not working. Um, so that could still bring money. And I think part of the money flowing in so fast without proper due diligence is because people are just greedy. Um, sure. Back to regulation. Yeah, regulation is part for money to come in, but regulation has also been proved not to work. I mean, FTX.us regulated. The CEO had personal meetings with Gary Gensler. Mm -hmm. So can we pin our hopes in regulation, the SEC to protect investors? Nope. Um, now, Bitcoin does have a huge heads up with being a potential commodity under the CFTC, and that will be good. I think that'll be the first to fall, and then money will you know, start flowing in there. And you've got big names already looking yeah. at that, the Fidelities, the Black Rocks, et cetera. I think the real, like if I was managing this whole space, what I think what we need to do is, again, going back to my first point of transparency, it's difficult for people to use DeFi because they can't onboard their fiat to trade in the first place without some type of KYC, centralized exchange, how they, you know, move money in to get started and then it needs to be easier to use and much more transparent and trustworthy and i think DeFi, I, the big shining star of this whole season mm -hmm. has been right. DeFi and how it's never gone down still works etc yeah certain things have blown up when there's a lot of liquidity and that's sure. just the nature of it but there's no uh, there's no how do i say you can't call up a DeFi protocol and say, hey, what's going on? <laughs> anyway, uh, but I think what CZ actually did was quite genius. You know, enforcing that kind of Merkle tree proof of reserves is great. We need better DeFi that works across all key tokens that aren't garbage tokens as well and make it easier for people to use wallets, people to do KYC, people to onboard fiat into this whole space. 
And going back to the kind of the iPhone, it needs to be made a lot simpler because a lot of people just aren't comfortable with it. And like you, I know people who are very sophisticated investors and they had a truckload of money on things like FTX. Even hearing about all the smoke and fire, they still didn't believe it at the last minute. And sure. they felt their money was safe because they didn't trust themselves with self-custody. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge hurdle uh, as well to the whole space. So uh, I wouldn't pin all my hopes and regulation. I'm hoping... <laughs> The cryptoverse, led by some key leaders, can make things easier, simpler, safer, more transparent to use for the greater market. That's the way forward. Otherwise, it might be a limbo for a while. But again, Bitcoin, there's Bitcoin and there's everything else, as everybody always says. <laughs> this then, is, well, this is true. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, uh, no. Anything else, James? Sorry. Nope. Gotcha. So I always say the thing you, you, we, we always talk about was regulation. And I know that that's a, that's a thorn in people's sides. And it is true. You know, as far as like uh, FTX was, I mean, FTX has the, the U.S. division. Unfortunately, they had a global division, uh, the FTX Global. Binance has a U.S. division. And of course, they also have Binance Global. However, I will say this. Um, I've been harping about regulation, and I think I've been a little bit off base. Not that we don't need regulation. I think we do, but I think it's just the start. I think it's just the beginning. There was this story. Uh, there's this guy named Bernie Madoff. I don't know if anybody heard of him, but uh, apparently he's been uh, quoted many a day, many a times now recently. Did you know that Madoff ran Madoff Securities LLC was investigated at least eight times over a 16-year period by the SEC? Eight times. Unbelievable. And uh, of course, they came in there and they're like, well, you know, let's, let's see what's going on. And they did an investigation and nope, everything's good to go. And then uh, also, uh, I believe Bernie Madoff, correct me in the comment section, uh, was uh, on the chair of, the, of NASDAQ or the president, I think, of NASDAQ. So you had the, uh, the, the top crook in chief and uh, he was calling all the shots. And that right there is a problem. And, and James, you talked about it that, hey, you know, Gary Gensler, who watches the show? Gary, glad you're here. Uh, that he... When, when when he came about and uh, and he had meetings with uh, with SBF, that's uh, multiple meetings. That's a problem. So I think the Merkel tree, the proof reserves, that's a good way to start, of course. But that only tells us half the story, right? That's your that is your your asset. This is what it kind of assets you have. What kind of loans are going on? What kind of liabilities do you have? What else do we have, right? So I think it's just like like healthcare, like in healthcare in the United States, every single hospital is accredited by JACO. Uh, the Joint Commission Accreditation for Hospital Organizations, whatever. Uh, and, they, and that's just the very base, what you have to have as, to, as far as like operate as far as a hospital. However, if you have other parts of that hospital, surgical centers, wound care therapy, physical therapy, whatever else, you can get additional accreditation to show that you have mastery or you are in the top 5%. I think if we can do something like that, like here's a base case. And it's not just me talking about that. Again, that Bankless show with Jesse Powell, he even says, he goes, you know, regulation, he said there, sh there should be some type of oversight that we can all get on board with and just kind of say, okay, here, this, we, we check these boxes, bing, 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 bing. And if you want to go above and beyond and be that next great exchange, then you do those things to attract a higher caliber of customers. I think that, I think, would really help out moving forward, but it could just be it. And then lastly, I'll say public perception is shot. Retail versus institutional, they're still, uh, they're still greed, and it's going to take some time for us to win everybody back. But uh, that's really on us. So last question, and James, I, I just left out with you, same thing. Um, question, where's, where's SPF in one year's time? <laughs> well, this is, uh, again, the type of stuff coming to the surface now is staggering. So the guy is either delusional or deranged. One of those Ds, to pick your choice. Um, you know, what, what is amazing is how he fooled so many people, how he was in cahoots with so many top names, you know, sitting with former U.S. presidents and British prime ministers and the Gary Gensler private meetings and passing Sequoia due diligence, which is used to be a brutal thing back in the day. And even CZ invested. So the question is, will he end up in prison? maybe, or in Bali or Dubai with the rest of the, you know, uh, where people tend to end up that are part of a lot of this kind of downfall. And I'm old enough to remember uh, the Bernie Madoff guy you just mentioned who had a scam that was 100 times more complicated 
than what Sam has done. And he was in handcuffs the same day when the feds learned exactly how he used clans funds to cover handcuffs the same day. Mm. But I question, and literally I question the amount of money and the connections to his parents and super PACs and democratic party. Maybe that hundred million dollars he spent on the democratic party is enough for a get out of jail free card. Could be wrong, but that's all yeah. in the subject it is a beyond, uh, like he should be life in prison for this guy. Yeah, um, we will. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. We will see. We will see if it actually happens. That I think is the bigger question. Will this happen? Mm-hmm. Ben, last question to you: SBF in a year? Do you really care? I, <laughs> Just, I, you I don't, don't care. I, I've never, I've never promoted that exchange or talked about it. Or I, I mean, you know, I. He probably he probably deserves to, to you know to. Um, answer for what he did but i mean you know i have no idea if they're going to actually go after him or not yeah sounds reasonable and last and last y'all to say uh in jail maybe who knows nobody really i mean in all honesty nobody really uh, cares they just want their crypto back let's jump into it so gentlemen that'll take care of the questions thanks for stopping by let's get into the little q a and answer people's questions out there in the wild so first things first let me uh pull this up so everybody, if you could do me a favor, I should, I should have said this on question number four, please start to put in your questions and I'll pick those questions from there. As I am waiting for those questions themselves, why don't we go to good old Twitter and see what you guys had. I even said here, I go, hey, do you see you live today? Got questions, put them below. Triple J, Smokey, Age of Sam, what do you think about the Solana ecosystem? I'm gonna say that's probably directed towards uh, James. James, what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> anytime I talk about that, it's like, you know, I, my it goes back to the thing I answered at the very beginning is in the cryptoverse, fundamental analysis doesn't matter. You got to know what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. But uh, the, there, there are this, you know, the right before all this happened, you know, they did partnerships with Google and Meta and released a whole bunch of staggering statistics around performance and mm-hmm. showed a lot of new DAFs that were being built, like an Uber killer and et cetera, sure. et cetera. Um, that was all just, you know, quite incredible. The problem is now is really to come to terms with what type of black eye the ecosystem has gotten, what's happening with funding, where all that stands. There's all sorts of rumors that they only had 1% on FTX versus maybe more. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it will definitely, it's a black eye. It's like if they're running a marathon and they broke a toe or twisted an ankle, it's going to mm-hmm. slow them down for sure. But uh, who knows where this will go? Uh, yeah. The team, like I, I just watch kind of the leaders like Raj and Anatoly and listen to what they say. You know, they, they, they feel they've got, you know, three years or 30 months left to fund this thing, make some difference. Hopefully that'll get us through the next bull market as well. We'll see. But uh, again, I go back to it's trading at 132nd of the market cap of ETH. Is mm. that cheap? Yeah, for what it does? Yeah, very yeah. cheap. But then again, could the whole thing blow up and go to zero? Right now, we've learned everything can blow up and go to zero real fast. And that's the big 2022 lesson. So never have all your eggs in one basket. The further you go at the risk curve, minimize your exposure. That's that simple. Yeah, exactly. And when the next bull run comes 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 along, don't diamond hands it, geniuses. Just start uh, taking profits. All right, Ben, this would be more more uh, a question for me and you. Do you consider DCing over the year and Bitcoin a mistake? This is from Chuck Norris, so we should probably answer it. We got to risk levels and prices that were very wanted for a long time: 30, 25, 20k, and now 16k. Even though cash is king, do you think having a 40% cash position right now is still decent? This would be, uh, yeah. Ben, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I mean, yeah, cash is king this year. If yeah. you if you have a multi year outlook, I mean, you know, I, I I do think Bitcoin will eventually make it back to thirty k and and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think I, I mean I'm I actually have more than four. I'm actually at like sixty three percent cash right now. I'm like super sure, heavy yeah. cash. Um, just because I've been I've been quite bearish this year, but I you know. As we get into 2023, mm-hmm. I, I'll probably start to, to shift my tune. You know, I'm not going to stay bearish forever. Just, you know, want to protect myself in, in a bear market. So, I mean, you know, if you've, if you've picked up Bitcoin this year, yeah, you're, you're probably underwater. 
probably still going to be com- still underwater for a while, to be completely honest. Um, especially if you were buying it at like, you know, 40K and whatnot. But uh, eventually, eventually, I, I think it'll work out. It just, I, I don't know how long. I don't know exactly how long. I mean, if you think back to like where Bitcoin normally is mm-hmm. at its having, it normally gets back to like its quote unquote fair value. So, you know, I think. I think there's a case to be made that Bitcoin will probably get back to the 30 to 40 K range in 2024. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if you just sort of keep your head down and, and you're smart about, about accumulating over 2023, then eventually you'll be rewarded. But again, I mean, these things take a long time in 2014, 2018, we're both bear markets. And then after a bear market, you normally go sideways for a year or, or longer it's a, yeah. it's it's a marathon. So I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't buy Bitcoin with the expectation that it's going to shoot up tomorrow because you know there's still there still is a good chance we continue going lower down. I mean I, I said earlier I mean I I wouldn't spend too much of your time thinking about if the bottom's in or not in 2022 because it's just a bear market. It's just um you know you you wait longer and the price eventually goes down. So I mean I, I think 40 percent cash is a, is, a, is at least a good place to be because it'll give you some flexibility in in 2023. Yeah, I can see that. All right. And then, uh, where are we here? You go this one. I think this is an interesting point. Oh, okay. Before I go on to that one, uh, Ben, this is a question really quick for you again. You had Mark Yusko on. He was talking about fair fair market value. And he he talked about a couple of different charts. And he talked about uh, the ones that he uses. And he was talking about 10,000 in 2017 and then he used something else for 2020 did he give you one of those fair market values i know over on on your website in the cryptoverse you've got uh, the fair market value uh, over there as well i mean he didn't give me anything specific um i mean you can you can have like a, a logarithmic regression chart and fit it to like you know non-bubble data right and, and try to get a fair value for bitcoin i i do think if you if you do that with the current data it would still say the fair value is is just below 20k or so yeah. um but you know, we know we can go undervalued and spend six to twelve months there before going back, before going back up, right? So I think that's what people have to remember is that we can spend a year if we can spend a year being overvalued, we can spend a year being undervalued. Gotcha. And this one, gotcha. So this one is more for geared towards James. Pull it in here. Any. This is from Jerome. He says, if the regulation comes hard for the altcoin market, do you see a possibility of a Bitcoin and maybe ETH only bull market? Meaning, of course, people want to stay away from these quote unquote securities and, and, and the collapse and who knows what's going to happen as far as consolidation. James, what do you think here? Yeah, if anything, I think, first of all, there's two ways to answer that. One is everything that's happened has proven the need for Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. Everything else is very far at the risk curve. Second thing is Gary Gensler, the SEC, has clearly taken shots at Ethereum being a security going forward. So there's a lot of chatter around that. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty certain that Bitcoin, especially with the new leadership in the House, etc., will be listed as a commodity going forward. The jury is out on Ethereum. But again, like Ben mentioned earlier, you know, the big chains have enough money to uh, you know, pass the compliance to be a security, but I think everything else would be a security at this stage. There's a good chance of that. And in terms of what happens, and we, we discussed this actually back in the summer, despite the knowledge and everything else, people are still YOLOing into stuff that is complete garbage. So everybody still wants to buy something for a fraction of a fraction of a cent and hope it'll get to a dollar because if they have a million of them or 10,000 of them, it'll make them a millionaire. And people still have that G or Q mentality, which I think is a problem. But uh, I think, again, there's Bitcoin and there's everything else. Uh, jury's out on Ethereum. And the rest of the, the bigger chains that can be compliant will make it, as long as they have value propositions, USPs. Yeah. Good point. And then we are coming up on the hour long. So I'm just going to just uh, end it with this. Somebody had a question. I can't pull it up for some reason, but the question is, what's the chances of uh, Bitcoin going to zero? So anybody want to take that one? I've, I've always said 1% <laughs> to be safe, but uh, there was a study out of it's MIT or Yale. I think it's Yale. 
and they they have the calculation now down to about 0 0.03 or 0.35 percent of it going to zero. So it's a uh, low. It's still risky. There's risk with everything out there. Yeah. Absolutely. Ben, yeah, Ben. Anything on that one? I mean, I I don't think it's going to zero. I mean. I mean, I'm not going to just pull a number out of my, you know, my <laughs> I know what the uh, probability is, but I mean, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to go to zero. I mean, it can go, it might go lower than, than a lot of people think it might, but I, I, I still think it will be resilient and, and it will come back. Um, and, and to answer your other question as well, I mean, I, I do think there's a, a case to be made that, that Bitcoin could experience a rally by itself and, and it could, exp it could experience that as early as next year. Yeah. Um, uh, again, think back to 2019, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin went up like 4x and a lot of altcoins did did not do much of anything. Some of them did. But um, I mean, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if if Bitcoin just after after this bear market is over and, and we get into some of the altcoin regulation stuff yeah. and, and, and are they securities and are they not? There's going to be a lot of people that are just going to say to hell with my altcoins. I don't want to deal with it. If they're going to get delisted from exchanges, I'd rather just put it into Bitcoin. And, you know, I mean, that could lead to Bitcoin going higher and, and altcoins going lower. I mean, I, I do think, you know, and, and one more thing. Hmm. Altcoins normally bottom against Bitcoin six to 10 months after Bitcoin bottoms against the U.S. dollar. So, so yes, yes, altcoins have gotten destroyed this year. Mm -hmm. um, they can keep getting destroyed against the U.S. dollar. But furthermore, even after Bitcoin bottoms, they'll likely still get wrecked on their Bitcoin pairs until Bitcoin goes through another parabolic run to some degree. I mean, some altcoins will, will have many, many alt seasons maybe at some point. But for the most part, I, I, I think a lot of the altcoin market, it remains, remains in traffic on Struggle Street until probably the end of 2023. At least on their Bitcoin pairs, they could bottom against the U.S. dollar well before that. Yeah, yeah. And I have I have those exact numbers, by the way. It was Yale. Thank God it wasn't MIT. We heard enough crap out of MIT. <laughs> so two things are important. One, the implied daily disaster probability for Bitcoin going to zero is now zero point three percent, and this is from Yale University professor Ale. Tzivinsky. Hope I got that right. And uh, Yukun Liu, and also. Another guy called Robert Schiller, who is a Yale Nobel Prize winner, he said Bitcoin could be extinct in the year 2118. So, okay. gentlemen, we have another, what, 96 years to go? Uh, I, won't be, I won't be around to see that. So that's yeah. good. All right. Yes, so. well, with your Puerto Rican lifestyle, you'd be just fine. Yeah. Let's get gets tough. Well, get, well, guys, I want to say thanks again for stopping by. I do appreciate the both of you. Everybody, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Also, check out these two guys. And then just remember, of course, uh, it wasn't a crypto project. It was a crypto exchanges that failed us. So hopefully, better things ahead. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you. See you on the next one. Thanks, so. Uso.